Hello, you're listening to the K-12 Tech Podcast, bringing you insights into the world of education technology. Stay tuned as we discuss the past, the present, and most importantly, the future of technology in our schools. Don, thank you for being on episode four or five of the Origins Podcast, and then um, we're going to split it up into two segments because we got some feedback from some, from some listeners about um, missing kind of more of the technical side, so... We'll be talking about that in um, the second part of this. So I appreciate you coming out to the Valpo office. This wasn't too bad of a drive with you. No, no, it was actually pretty good. Nice, uh, surprisingly slow Chicago traffic morning. So I'll I'll take that any day. And uh, before we we started the podcast, I, I saw you had pulled up. He's got a a, a Tesla, and then he's got the uh, Beta. Um, uh, self driving, yeah, stuff. full self driving. So yeah. we we're talking yeah. about that, but uh, that's. That probably it's makes cool. the drive. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Probably makes the drive a lot more easy. So it does. Yeah. So with the origin stories, we're just trying to really bring people's stories out and um, highlight the decisions people made during their life and, and what interests they have, core interests they have that brought them to where they are today to help encourage a younger generation um, that are coming into these roles and, and what they can be doing early on. In their in their journey um, for uh, their careers mm-hmm. to get there, because I mean, really, if you think about it, there's just in the public public K through twelve, there's about fifteen to sixteen thousand public schools. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. sixteen thousand tech directors mm-hmm. that need to be out it there, is. and, and um, that doesn't even include on the private sector, which mm-hmm. is probably a similar number. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I'd love to start. Why don't we start from the beginning? Um, when did you start getting interested in technology and that could be, you know, you can go f- as far back as you want yeah. and walk me through college. That's interesting. Um, I was always kind of a tech guy, um, was into it, you know, building my own computers and things like that. Um, so I, when I started college, um, I was majoring in computer science and, and uh, you know, did the computer engineering classes. Um, ended up in a class where we had to write some code that would defragment a hard drive, you know, and this is back in the 90s, you know, so Mm -hmm. I'm I'm very slow, really hard to troubleshoot and that sort of thing. So I've been working on this program for probably an entire week and then finally said, you know what, this isn't what I want to do for a living. Um, So I took a very strange term, a turn, and uh, majored in philosophy for the rest of the way. So I got a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Okay, I got, time out. Why, yeah. why philosophy? Walk me through that. You know, here's the thing. You know, I was always kind of into science, too, mm-hmm. and into, like, these big questions, like, you know, why are we here? You know, does God exist? You know, that sort of yeah. thing. So always into those really, really big, giant questions. And physics can help you with that. There's no science that can help you with that. It's really philosophy that, that you know, what what should I do? You know, and that's the basic question of ethics is what should I do? You know, what what ought I to do? And these big questions really intrigue me. So that's why I majored in philosophy. So Wow. That yeah. that's that, that that's quite a transition for yeah, sure from, yeah. from computer science to philosophy. Well and the interesting thing was too though when I was in the master's degree program, um I was working with a professor um who was doing some indexing on a on a book that he was writing. And so we managed to automate some of that indexing for him, both in German, English, and in Greek. Um, and we did the indexing. And, you know, I was doing it on a 48625, you know, and so it was it was taking a little while. But, uh, um, yeah, so I was able to kind of combine my interests that way. That's so, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, were there any mentors, like, kind of looking back even early on into high school, did you have any like mentors or anybody who kind of breathed into you and helped kind of develop you as a leader? Yeah. You know what? Um, it's funny. You remember all your managers from way back and, and, you know, uh, Chuck Brown, you know, when I was working in restaurants, when I was in high school, you know, I'll always remember that guy. Um, there was a, another restaurant manager who was a psych major who, you know, kind of influenced me to some extent. Um, Really, when I got out into, I, I started in the private sector, and really when I got in there, um, you know, it was people like Philip King, who uh, was a regional service manager at Best Buy, and now he, uh, he runs a service center in Chicago. Um, but it was those kind of people that I really learned a lot from, not only from a customer service standpoint, but from, a, you know, just a, a kind of a workflow, um, 
managing ticketing systems, that sort of thing. So, yeah. so walk me through that. So you, you're in, did you end up getting your master's through the master's program? Yeah, I ended up getting a master's degree in philosophy and then did the coursework for a PhD. Um, by then it was becoming apparent that nobody was getting tenure in philosophy. Mm. Um, so I, I stopped at that point. Um, and uh, you know, uh, there's still a kind of a gut thing in me that wants to teach. Um, I was an adjunct for a couple of years at a community college. Um, so there's that interest in me in education too. Um, so that I think played a really big factor in me getting where I'm at now. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you graduate, you get your master's. Uh, what, what's your kind of first job out of college? My first job out of college after I finished that, that, um, Oh, the PhD work. I was working at Best Buy the entire time I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. um, so this regional service manager position came open um, about six months after I graduated. You know, I've got a brand new daughter, so, you know, it's time for me to make some money. And uh, so I took this regional service manager position, and that was essentially supervising all the technical people in the Best Buy stores. Um, yeah, because that's pre-Geek Squad, right? Yeah, that's that's pre-geek squad in some sense i'd like to say that i'm one of the original geeks wow. um there was uh there, there was there was a few of us that kind of did a study on on services nationwide and found that we had a pretty good competency for technical services so you know we we explored that a little bit we wrote a standard operating procedure for that and then you know at that point uh, we hired a new vice president, which, you know, is, again, another leader that influenced me, uh, mm -hmm. Lowell Peters. Um, so we hired him away from Sears, bought Geek Squad, and the rest is history. So well, That's awesome. So how long were you in that position? I started in that, what, 97, and uh, didn't leave until 2006. Okay, so you did yeah. quite a bit of time. You did yeah, nine years. Did. <coughs> so what changed? So at, at the time... Uh, Best Buy wanted to move that service center down to Louisville, Kentucky. And, and it's now down there. It's called Geek Squad City. Um, one of the guys that worked for me in Chicago is now the quote-unquote mayor of Geek Squad City. And I didn't want to move to Louisville, Louisville. They wanted me to do analytics in Minneapolis, and I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I left. And, you know, that, that was essentially it. I just left. So, and and where, where did you end up going to right after that? Position? So I worked in a little company in the private sector that folded. You know, they just didn't, it yeah. didn't work out. Um, and then at the time, uh, the school district I lived in was looking for a tech leader, um, you know, to sort of coordinate customer service and do that sort of thing. Um, so I took the job. Awesome. So um, when you're taking that job, obviously coming from the, the, the private sector and then going into the public sector, what's the, the biggest difference? Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe outline some things that were really refreshing mm -hmm. about it and maybe some things that were extremely difficult. You know, the actually, I don't know that there was anything that was extremely difficult. I mean, the staff at this district was amazing. Um, it was good to, you know, be around students. You know, it was really, really good to be in that environment. My daughter actually was in junior high at the time and waved at me while I was in the school, which blew my mind. Um, excuse me. But uh, um, so, yeah, I don't think there was. And, and the thing that I think I brought to that that district and the thing I still think I bring now is just this relentless focus on customer service. Yeah. It's always about we, we can't think of, of what we do in public schools as technologists as Technology. We don't do technology. We do education, and yeah. everything we do in technology supports that. And I, I know everybody knows that, but in some cases, it's a little harder to live it than to, um, than to know it intellectually. <coughs> what do you? Because uh, I like this. I, li I like that your story starts out in the private sector. A lot of the people I talk to, most of them have been in education their mm -hmm. whole lives for a lot of portions of it. What stuff do you feel like you learned in the public sector that have really helped you with your career in the in the in the public sector? So essentially, uh, we and actually I've used this in every job since then. Uh, we we did a lot of work at Best Buy in really creating a great culture for people to work in. Um, so we really really focused pretty hard on. A, there was a book called First Break All the Rules by Marcus Buckingham. 
and he actually came out and talked to us. But we used to have a significant part of our evaluation is our employee satisfaction slash engagement uh, numbers uh, based on the Gallup 12 questions. It starts with, uh, I have the tools and equipment, I need to do my work. And then the, the last question, the 12th question is, I have a best friend at work. And, you know, it kind of goes from there. Um, I've used that ever since to really to drive customer engagement, um, drive engagement on my team. And really part of it is the strengths finder that it has where it really assesses what your strengths are. And it's pretty accurate, but I do that with my teams to say, okay, here's what I'm good at. Here's what you're good at. Here's, you know, what this person is good at. And so we can say, okay, you know, Laura Addis, you know, one of my, the manager in charge of my technicians is really good at this. I'm not really good at it. So if I need some help with that, if I need, you know, somebody to weigh in on that, help me out with it, I go to Laura, you know, and this way we can kind of work together as a team and really complement each other. Yeah, it, that's been really refreshing because, you know, uh, behind closed doors when I'm talking with a lot of tech directors, I hear not so psyched about their staff and mm -hmm. people they inherited. And, oh, this is someone's niece. This is mm -hmm. superintendent's niece or whatever. Right. And um, the last, the, the tech directors have really gotten to know and really respect have been ones that have been really focused on that culture. It's like enjoyability, but then also accountability. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think, I think there's like a misnomer and, and, you know, I'm see we have, you know, 60, 70 employees in this business um, is that people think like, I don't want to over, you, you don't want to overwhelm your employees, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. also your employees don't want to come to work and not feel like they're needed. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, the one thing I always tell people that, that work for me is if you dread coming to work in the morning, if you're at work and you're unhappy with it, you know, life is short, you know, yeah. you can't, spend your time doing a job you don't like. So if you're unhappy, then you need to go be happy. You need to figure out what you need um, in your life. And so so I do that with staff, um, but at the same time, I tell everybody, you know, part of working for me is having fun. Yeah. You know, if you're not having fun, then it's just not worth doing, in, in my mind. How do, you, uh, how do you help an employee, um, especially some of the monotonous things that have to be done, how do you help them to have fun? So the thing is, is we just like to maintain. So, you know, I'll walk around and, and you know, in my, in my role at Best Buy, I'd actually sing a little bit to people. Um, unconventional, but I like to lead by example and, and really have fun by example. So, you know, I'll, I'll work with the staff to, you know, get them to know that I want them to have fun. And I'll do that by modeling having fun to some extent. And, you know, I've been in the current job I'm in. I'm, in now since July 1st. And I think my staff is having fun now, it seems like. So, so it's nice to, it's nice to be able to do that. Yeah. During our discovery call, um, so you got into education at your, your daughter's district, and then you've, you've, um, had a few changes mm -hmm. or cause you're like 2007, um, to now, you know, you have, you know, um, 16 years yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Um, can you walk through kind of that 16 years and things that you feel like you've accomplished and you have tons of certifications mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's really helped you go into that district? And I, I don't know if this is a, a good question to ask or not, but like, you kind of seem like a guy that's almost like a bar rescue, like the bar rescue show. Like you kind of <laughs> go in and you fix it and you yeah. develop people and then it's kind of running itself. You're like, well, like going to move on to the next one. Or it's really funny you say that because well, when I started out, I was at Oswego School District, which is in the town I live in. And uh, one of the people that I worked with is, was on the Board of Education in the neighboring town. And, you know, she said, look, we're looking to bring somebody in. Um, what do you think? So I went over there. And that school district was broken when I got there. They had just fired everybody in technology. Um, you know, the only building that had, like, a real enterprise-grade wireless network was the high school um, there were 10 elementary schools at the time and three middle schools, none of which really had a wireless network that was that was even close to being what we needed. Um, so over the course of that, the first thing we did is hire temporary people um, and then started working on upgrading those buildings with vendors. Um, the people that I brought in as temps, um, two of them actually uh, followed me to the next district. Um, you know, Anthony Reiskus, Jeff Drenthe, they are, you know, 
rock stars um, and were able to help build that team and really hire the right people and do those sorts of things. So, so from that progression of where it was broken, it really started with getting the right people in the right yeah. place. And then, you know, handling that technology piece, but the key is, is getting the right people in the right place. And, and, you know, like I said before, using their strengths to really push us forward. Yeah, I like that. So um, you're, you're 16 years and then kind of talk the, the, the your final transition to where you are now, just that decision. And Well, and as, as I told you when we were chatting a little bit before, um, I was driving 84 miles a day uh, to get to the district that I worked in at the time. And uh, honestly, you know, that's taking two and a half hours out of your yeah. day. Um, I just, it, it was just to a point where I just couldn't take the commute anymore. Um, I was lucky enough in that the district, a district like, what, 15 minutes from my house, I uh, had a position open. It was an unfortunate reason they did have it. The previous person in the role passed away. Mm -hmm. um, but they were open and, you know, I interviewed for the job and was, you know, very fortunate to get it. And now... I drive 15 minutes a day, you know, there and back. So oh, 15 minutes there, 15 minutes back. So, you know, I can work till five o'clock and be home at a quarter after five rather than 630, you yeah. know, which is a huge benefit. It really makes a difference. Yeah, that's massive. <clears throat> so for all the people, either they're technicians at a school or maybe they're a teacher, what are some things, what are some pieces of advice you would give them to help them to hone their skills and to start working their way towards a, 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 either a technician role or um, instructional role or a tech director role? So what I would say is that you really have to, A, you know, first, to me, that customer service orientation is huge. Um, and even in teaching staff, I mean, you know, our parents and our kids, they're the reason we're there. And we have to make sure that we're investing in them. And for technology leaders... Um, or tech ones, whomever, the reason we're there is to support staff. And, you know, we interact with kids too, but our job is to make it easier for staff to do their job yeah. and then to have ways for them to better connect with students. So that's huge. So it's, for me, it's really that customer service excellence. Now, in, in terms of hiring a tech one, uh, one of the best people that ever worked for me was a tractor guy who put together lawn tractors mm -hmm. and he came in and really was about the best that I had. Um, and it's, it's that it's really just having that, the customer service skill, the, the willingness to, uh, you know, make a mistake to, you know, to do what you can and, you know, admit that, okay, you know what, that didn't work, but, you know, find the troubleshooting steps, you know, that troubleshooting aspect yeah. is okay. But I always tell my people too, don't be afraid to make mistakes because we all do. And, to, you know, essentially looking over your shoulder, worried about making mistakes is a horrible way to work. Um, so that's, that's one thing I tell everybody is don't be afraid to make mistakes, but at the same time, you know, make it better, you know, don't make the same mistake over and over. But for an aspiring tech leader, I'd say, you know, you just, A, really determine what you want to do, you know, have an idea of where you want to go. Like, for example, I've got I always work on professional development with my teams. And, you know, I've got people that have no desire to be a tech leader. I've got others that do. Um, so my job is to develop them. Yeah. Um, but I would say make sure that you're engaging with whomever you work for, letting them know what you want, um, working on professional development to get you there. I mean, getting a CETL certification, you know, as the guy from COSIN is going to say that. But, uh, um, you know, get that certification, get involved, um, you know, get to know your fellow leaders or your fellow aspiring leaders. Get a mentor. I've mentored a couple of people in my career. And to me, that's a really important part of what we do. But have a mentor that can help move you forward, too. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So <clears throat> being a um, tech director or executive director of technology is very stressful. You're kind of basically kind of like always on call. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you've had plenty of those late night, yep. Saturday night calls. Yep. Hey, we've been right. hacked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you do to, to recharge, to fill yourself? Um, maybe some personal disciplines you have that's like good for your mental health. So first of all, I, I do mindfulness. So I try to get into places where I, I try to empty my mind and just be in the world. So for me, it's listening to things around me that really, sort of takes me out of, 
you know, worrying about the future or, or fretting about the past. You know, just being there listening to me is, is huge. Um, so I'll do that. Um, I love to read. So, you know, I'm, and, you know, by the certifications, I love to learn too. So that's really a way that I keep myself engaged is by, you know, reading, learning. I'm still reading philosophy, actually. Um, so for me, it's, it's really, it's, it's, I suppose, recharging for me, spend time with my family. I play golf. So, so doing that. What's your handicap on the pod? Oh, God, you don't even know. I, I struggle breaking a hundred. So yeah, that's you know, all right. Hey. You know, it's, yeah. it is what it is. I'm getting better, but you know. Yeah. I used to, I, when I was in high school, I played golf like six or seven days a week, nice. uh, every day, every day. Cool. And then, uh, uh, I was in the military, so I didn't get to play as much. Then I got married and had kids and now I play like 10 times a year. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, well, it like changes. You get older and like, for example, yeah. my son and I are playing on, on Sunday. So yeah, that's know, really that's, fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So one thing I actually did want to ask you, um, just with you getting your master's in philosophy, do, do you feel like any of that translated into your current job? Um, and then do you have any books that you would suggest would be a good one for an intro into that stuff? That, you know what, it, it, every day I think that plays in because one thing about philosophy, it's about critical thinking. Mm -hmm. It's about analyzing things. So like, for example, when I'm looking at contracts, I can I really focus on details. We had a cyber attack in my last district and, you know, we were combing through registry entries on one computer and, you know, boom, seeing that one entry that looked weird, you know, and just being able to, you know, A, come in from a high level standpoint, but then be able to see the details too. Um, so I think philosophy helps with that. Um, for an introductory book on philosophy, that's tough. Um, philosophers are really bad writers. We <laughs> Philosophers write, we write for each other essentially. And, you know, if you look at some of the stuff I wrote back in the day, it's, it's just so technical that it's, that it's bad. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that. A good intro book for philosophy. Or a favorite. A favorite of mine? Um, I'm a fan of Heidegger's being in time. Now, mm -hmm. Heidegger wasn't the best person, um, you know, lived in Germany during the Nazi, Nazi era, and, and wasn't, he was reprehensible for that point. But the whole notion of being in time and what time is. So, you know, I'm sitting in a leadership meeting in my last district, and you know, a friend of mine are at a table and I'm, and, and, you know, I just said, what is time? You know, let's think about what is time. And that is a, a very, it's a hard question. Um, the district I was in before this one, I, I developed a pretty good relationship with a math teacher and shared a book with him, uh, Lee Smolin's, uh, oh, I can't remember the title of the book, um, but it's about how time is more constant than matter. Yeah. And, and, you know, it just sort of those things fascinate me. Did uh, did you see the movie Interstellar? Yeah, I did. What did you think of like the representation of time towards the end? I thought that was good. I mean, you know, just the, you know, the time dilation that you that you get with Einstein's relativity, obviously, yeah. and in gravity fields. Um, I thought that was really good. I mean, it was really well done. And then, you know, obviously coming back and seeing his daughter as an old woman, that was yeah. that was neat. But even then, being able to go back to um, you know, uh, Doctor, oh, I can't remember what her name was, but anyway, yeah, Anne Hathaway's character. Anne Hathaway's yeah. character, yeah, going back and her being the same age because she's still under the influence of this, you know, this gravitational time dilation. It was pretty cool. Yeah, very. I uh, uh, cry every time I watch that. Movie. Yeah, you know, you know what I found really fascinating. Some of those videos in the beginning were from Ken Burns' documentary about the dust, a uh, dust bowl yeah. in the '30s. So I I watched that documentary too. It was pretty, yeah. pretty neat. So this segues into the last part we okay. do for the origins, which yeah. is what's your favorite book and what's your favorite movie, and then why are they your favorite book and favorite so movie? So for me, the favorite movie is Field of Dreams. Okay. And it's because my son was a huge, huge baseball player. You know, started playing travel baseball when he was six. I played baseball um, for a while, too. Um, but, you know, he ended up becoming just this really, really good pitcher. He had a devastating curveball. Um, but for me, Field of Dreams is about fathers and sons, Yeah, you know, and so that really resonated with me, with my son. Um, we actually went out to Dyersville, and, you know, I've got pictures of us playing catch. He was on the mound. I was catching, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. My favorite book, 
<sighs> That's tough. I've got a lot of favorite books. Uh, I was reading, I've been reading, I've been really into strategy lately. Mm -hmm. So I read Thucydides, you know, uh, account of the Peloponnesian War. Um, there's a book uh, by a guy named Guy Rummelt called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Um, we also had a really great presentation at one of our um, Illinois Educational Technology Leaders um, with a, I, I, his first name's Jeffrey, I forget his last name, but he took us through Pearl Harbor. You know, and it was a leadership training. So it was him who was a former Army colonel, yeah. and then it was another guy who did uh, global HR for, like, Quaker Oats and some other things, and they facilitated it. Um, but it was, you know, walking you step through step by what happened at Pearl Harbor and what would you do as a leader in that case, and I found that fascinating. So I, I've really been reading histories of, uh, you know, of, of uh, Ian Toll's got, a hist like, a three-part history of the Pacific War, in World War Two, and and I'm just fascinated by that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. <coughs> that's that's like one thing that's like transition for me. I'm enjoying reading more analytical business books, leadership books than I did. Like I, I read like a lot of fantasy, like trash. Like, yeah, right. You know, like <laughs> books and stuff. Um, but that like is like learning, like that is like something that's just like I've enjoyed more and more. Like every yeah. year. Like, yeah. My my wife gives me a hard time because I. I just don't read nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. um, I had a professor, you know, when I was studying philosophy as an undergrad, Elmer Klemke. Um, you know, somebody asked him why he doesn't read fiction, and he said because there's too much to know. You know, there's mm -hmm. just so much to know that why would I read that? You know, I, I like some fiction, but yeah, not much. Well, thanks so much uh, for being part of the origins. I hope the story like helps shape people. 